This podcast is brought to you by the Office of Public Affairs of the Baha'is of the UK, which seeks to contribute to the progress of British society at the level of thought through interesting, unifying and collaborative approaches to topical issues. This episode marks the beginning of our series on socio-economic equality, crucial to a healthy society. Two principles that guide our conversations on this podcast are optimism and collaboration. It's important to engage with sensitive subjects in a meaningful way, with hope for the future, while also acknowledging the difficulties of the present reality. Collaboration and working together is vital in all aspects of society to propel progress and growth. Ultimately, these values inspired us to reach out to Linda Scott, a leading academic in the field of women's participation in the economy. Her book, The Double X Economy, is an international success, delving into the issues encountered by women, and consequently, society in general, as women are denied an equal role within our economic system. Professor Scott moved from the US to the UK 17 years ago, working as a professor at Oxford University for 10 years, and has conducted extensive research throughout the world on this topic. As this series aims to address complex issues around socioeconomic equality, it brings us great joy to launch this first episode with Linda Scott, whose knowledge and vision aligns so closely with one of the main principles of the Baha'i faith, unity in diversity. When I started this job, um, one of the first lectures that I went to was yours at um, at LSE when you were talking about um, your book, The Double X Economy, but which was like so struck by the idea of collaborating with you that um, a few colleagues and I just drafted an email and sent it to you, really not expecting much, just a lot of hope and excitement that we just really enjoyed your your talk and loved your book and wanted to see if we could collaborate in whatever shape or form and uh, the shape and form that it took ended up being this podcast so thank you, thank you. that's very kind you know it has been um it's been a, a a wonderful experience for me that um as the book the book has been translated now into I think 14 different languages and as the book appears around the world more and more I get inquiries from um people to will I come and speak um, I just got one this morning to go to Sydney for example and what happens is, of course, the more you talk about, it, the more people that I meet and that who then meet each other, right? Mm-hmm. right, the more activity there is. And you can start to see this really kind of wonderful potential for um, even a global network around um, this, what is really a very positive movement, um, because because empowering women economically is something that has nothing but positive outcomes associated with it. It's important to understand, I think, that at this point in time, British men and women are equal in terms of their skills and their uh, education levels, and they have been for really quite a long time. But the women are still not catching up uh, to the men, um, although they're very close in terms of the uh, the degree to which they are employed, for example. Um, they are still very much more likely to work part time. They're paid less. They don't get into leadership jobs. They have less access to capital. Um, there are still just really quite a lot of ways in which they're still held back. And this is happening primarily because the government is not willing to take concrete steps to encourage equality, and in particular, to uh, as far as the workplace is concerned, to enforce their own equality laws. Um, and this is something that happens in other countries too, but I think it's it's particularly noticeable in Britain because of just the way that that the government's unwillingness to make it feasible for women to have in real time equal rights um, has allowed private businesses the freedom to discriminate with impunity. Um, and it's it's a very unfortunate. Yeah. Has there been any movement towards? Um, applying certain policies that make things more equitable within the workplace? Have we like made certain strides to, yeah, to amend this issue? Yeah, I think that that there's no way to look at the record in Britain and say that there has been no progress. Uh, There certainly has been progress. The problem is that that progress is much slower than it should have been, uh, given the education level in Britain, the commitment to democracy, and so on and so forth. It's a country that should have come along a bit faster. And you can see actually um, where that's stalling out. It's 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 really 
you know, pretty obvious and, and, and could be fixed. All right. So that's that's another reason why the, the, it's, it's really um, no excuse for it. One of the things I think that that has occurred is that people don't realize that some of what you're dealing with uh, in the here and now, as far as inequality is, was baked in to the original equality legislation. So the Equal Pay Act of 1970 and, and, and so forth. At the time, although you have this story in Britain about how it all came down to the, you know, the Ford plant in Dagenham, and, you know, we've all seen that movie. Then in truth, what happened was that Britain wanted to join the EU and that in order to join the EU, you have to make a commitment to equal pay. You had to do it. It was part of the Treaty of Rome in 1957. Uh, it, equality between men and women is in the charter. It's also equal pay is specifically in Article 119. And so the British were going to have to make this commitment. And at the time, God bless them, the, the British public were very much in favor of equal pay legislation. Um, a poll at the time uh, showed three quarters of them uh, were in favor of it. But the government was just really slow to respond, as were the unions, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they finally got this Equality Act legislated, it had three things in it that sort of doomed it from the start. All right. And the first is that there was an information barrier. They said you had to be able, a woman had to be able to prove that she was doing the same job as a man and that she was getting less pay. All right. And that meant that she had to have access to that information. But at that time, it was illegal for people in the company to discuss pay. All right. So it was it was a catch-22 that was not going to be uh, feasible. And I will say this. So fast forward, uh, you know, 40 years or something, in 2010, uh, the update of the equality laws, um, it was made acceptable for the woman to ask, to ask for the information the companies had to give it to her. Mm -hmm. But then it took a really long time for the government to actually make that happen on the ground. And very quickly, businesses objected and they took it back. So you still have this problem where women are having to take a substantial risk to even ask the question, hire a lawyer, all of that, not really knowing for sure whether the information they think is there, in fact, is there. Yeah. All right. The second thing was, is that they said, and it's really a weird part of the, it's a very short little law, actually, that it would not apply to women who were pregnant, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. which foreshadows in the unwillingness to invest, for example, in child care, the motherhood penalty, that is such a big part of the gender pay gap. And I've always thought it was really weird because it's not clear. Does that mean it only applies when you are in gestation? All right. Or does it mean that thereafter, once you're pregnant, you have no equal rights? And they don't address that. They just say, you know, pregnant women need not apply. But it expresses this potential out that has that has manifested now as the biggest contributor to the gender gap is this attitude we have toward motherhood. All right. And the final thing, and I think this one is the most insidious, is that it starts uh, the positive discrimination doctrine, which says the sexes cannot be treated differently in any way. All mm -hmm. right. Which seems like on its face, seems like, oh, well, that's fair. But in fact, it's it's based on some um, some false assumptions that have then made it really nearly impossible for women to catch up. Yeah. We can see how laws, legislation, and policy at once both reflect like attitudes and cultural values, but also really perpetuate them and enshrine them within people's minds. Because even now, like you can ask about people's pay, it's not illegal anymore, but still like the, the discomfort and the cultural um, the kind of barrier that you face when doing that is just very obvious. And as you said, like we can see the kind of remnants of these laws today, even when they're, they've not been enacted for well, exactly, years. Exactly. Uh, I think the positive discrimination is very much a case in point. I think that my experience talking to British people for 10 years that I lived there um, was that they very much have internalized this idea that women and men must be treated exactly the same. You must not do anything to, to, help the women all right because that would be unfair to the men right and um and people just don't think through the flaws in that and i think they also don't realize that to my knowledge there is no other country in the world that subscribes to that doctrine okay mm -hmm. because it has some really basic flaws first it assumes that the women and the men are starting even 
Mm -hmm. right? So you can't do anything to help the women because that would put them ahead of the men. But in fact, what is the truth is that the women are always starting behind the men, all right? And in addition to that, the fact that they've been behind the men for centuries means that the men have built up a set of advantages, right? Networks, training, access to capital that continue to give them an advantage going forward so that they they are starting in a way that will give them much more speed and agility, right? In that race, right? Mm -hmm. And perhaps the worst part of it is not recognizing that that sex discrimination is not something you just kind of shut the clock off on. It's an ongoing process whereby one group, the advantage group, mm -hmm. uses their advantages to keep the disadvantaged group disadvantaged. Okay. And so that it has, there has to be some kind of intervention into that process. Mm -hmm. The last thing is, is it doesn't, it doesn't recognize something that is eminently evident in the Equal Pay Act of 1970. And that is that there is always resistance to the change. It's just like you and I were talking a little while ago about the idea that it's a zero sum game, that if I give up, if I give you something, that means I have less. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's built into the positive discrimination idea that it's going to hurt the men. And therefore, they don't recognize that resistance is going to pull down the whole thing. And so you have to be able to intervene to take care of those kinds of um, social and cultural responses. Yeah, I think because a lot of these issues are quite, um, they come from quite unconscious assumptions about how the world works and about how human nature works. But I'm sure that there are other barriers as well to that, like material barriers like cost. Yes, yes. It's, it's very, very costly, even just to get to the point where you're ready to go to court an equal pay case will cost the woman something in the neighborhood of 135,000 pounds. Now, keeping in mind that your average salary is like not even a third of that, right? That's a pretty big hurdle, all right? But in addition, the ability to recover what you have lost are, is extremely limited. So you can only get uh, the difference between your pay and the man's pay going back for a maximum of six years. So if the difference, let's say, is 10,000 pounds a year, okay, um, and that's a significant amount of money, but 10,000 times six is 60,000 pounds, that pales in comparison to the 135,000 that you would have to pay just to get to the starting gate on a lawsuit. And they also capped other kinds of damages such that they are it, the woman is virtually, virtually unable to recover what it would cost her. And what that means then is that equal pay is something that is really, financially speaking, only available to people who are, are making really quite a lot of money to begin with. It's out of reach of the average British woman because of this. Um, and then they loaded all kinds of other things on it, which um, some of which, one of which has been removed now, which is a, up until I think it was... 2017 or 18, maybe, if the woman brought the suit and then the employer thought, you know, uh, if she lost, the employer said, well, this was a nuisance suit to begin with, they could then make the woman repay them for their legal costs, all right? But the woman could not do the same, all right? Even though she had to pay the money to get what she should have had to begin with, she could not recover that money. It just became something that that was not possible to do. It's in, it's just infeasible. It also just compounds this idea that it, it is an us against them mentality. We're not working in good faith between employees and employers, between different like groups of people. It also just compounds those divisions. Right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think also that this points us to really something that I think all of us in kind of the Western economies, Western Europe and North America, Australia, uh, have taken for granted, actually, is it the way that we set this up to be enforced, uh, where the women who are wronged, they have to take the individual risk and spend their own individual money, uh, a lot of money, a lot of risk that you're going to fail, particularly in Britain, where, where there's not really a body of law uh, that is reliable in terms of planning a lawsuit, that that is the way to police this.
it not only puts that burden of claiming your own rights unfairly on one individual, but it does add to this expectation that this woman is just going to have to be a crusader all by herself because it's her own personal problem against mm -hmm. everyone else. All right. And so she's like the troublemaker, right? There had been a study done by, I think it's the European Commission, about how um, all across Europe and in those countries that I just mentioned, that they set it up like this and that none of them, after 50 years, had reached equal pay. That what they found was that in the end, it wasn't the, uh, it wasn't the employers um, uh, so much as it was the government just not having the will to enforce it. And this business of putting it all on the individual women. And so what was suggested as a solution, I think, tells a lot. And that is that instead of putting it on individuals, you would have like a, an agency, like um, the uh, Her Majesty HMRC, something like that over here at the Social Security or the IRS, um, that would just require a report every year of every company. And if you fell down, you would get fined. Right. Um, that, the, that, the, that the information would be automatically collected. It would be automatically enforced and that individuals would not have to do that. And, and, you know, there's no reason because there's already kind of the infrastructure in place to do that because you have the tax agencies and the, and the social benefits agencies. And I think that not doing it that way kind of points up that we just don't really think it's important enough. We don't really want it to happen. If you thought it was important enough, It'd be like the fire marshal. Fire marshal comes to your place of business and checks to make sure you're in compliance. If you're not in compliance, you have to pay something and fix it, right? And that's because, of course, it's important for workplaces to be safe from fire. Well, it's important for workplaces to be safe from discrimination, too. And if we really thought that, we would do something like the fire marshal, right? So I've got a question for you, Linda. There was a report produced by the Baha'i International Institution called the Universal House of Justice in 85, 1985, in the midst of the Cold War and these lobbies for peace at the time. And they talk about this uh, paralysis of political will. And that actually comes from this idea that we have this paradox. On the one hand, we believe that it's possible to solve this problem of equal pay. But then on the other hand, we also believe that human nature is inherently selfish. We are self-serving economic agents. And we don't really think about each other when we make economic decisions. And that's just in our nature. And that kind of paradox creates this paralysis. And in some ways, like you're right, sometimes it comes from this idea that we're not sure if it's important enough. But on the other side, I think maybe the weight of this important issue is coming into direct contrast with our deep rooted beliefs in, you know, whether human nature is ready for this change or, or are, is this inherent to our nature that we can actually see each other as being equal? Yeah, what do you think about that? Right. So it's, as you probably know, at this point, there's a lot about this in my book, because one of the things that comes up as a as an um, objection to gender equality is some version of, oh, but it's natural to do things this way. Right. Or we can't change it because this is just how it is. Um, and as far as specifically what you're asking about whether human beings are, are just naturally selfish, um, really, this is something that we have internalized from the economic theory under which the global system currently works, right? The idea that that human beings act in their own self-interest and and um, and that somehow everybody acting in their own self-interest aggregates to uh, an optimal outcome for everybody, all right? And so we shouldn't fix it. The implication is we should never do anything to change that. We can't do anything to change that, which actually I'm, I was just teaching a class. I teach a class at Brown. I was just teaching last night and said, you know, look, could you think of an economic theory that would better ensure that the rich and powerful remained rich and powerful than one in which the best, the best possible outcome will be had by everything remaining as it is? Right. I mean, that that just says everybody who's on the gravy train now stays on the gravy train and everybody who's not. It's just tough. Right. Yeah. We have to get out from under that kind of thinking. It's nothing more than how we have chosen to think about economics in this moment. If anybody could define human nature right now, they would win the Nobel Prize because the idea 
of what is human nature right now is very much up for grabs in the sciences. What we know right now is that human nature, if anything, is malleable. One of the most distinctive mm -hmm. things about our species and one of the main contributors to our survival has been that we are able to look at our situation and notice that something is wrong and make a plan together and execute it. Right? It is because of that that we have been able to spread all over the world and adapt to all kinds of different ecological environments, climates. We've devised different diets, different clothing, different shelter because we're able to do that. So that to say, well, you know, we can't we can't look at this problem and figure out how to solve it because it's our nature not to do that is just false. It's in our nature to solve our own problems. And that's we need to have faith in our own agility. Right. We this is what we do and we can do it. That's so true. Now that you mentioned this idea of like we can solve this problem, um, is this purely a British problem or do we know of other countries that have also like taken strides and uh, we can, yeah, we can learn from them? Yeah, I think that it's really one of the big missions for me here these days is to try to make sure that people are starting to understand that we have data now, big data sets that tell us what really is going on with women economically around the world that we did not have at one time. And so we kind of have grown up with some ideas that, you know, some countries have solved the problem and some countries are just, you know, primitive or whatever like that. And mm -hmm. now we have global nation level data that show us that in fact, uh, women are unequal economically and otherwise uh, in every country of the world every country, there's not a single country that has solved its gender problem. And that the pattern of those disadvantages is the same in every country. It may be a little higher there and a little lower over here, but the pattern overall is the same. And that the same mechanisms hold it in place everywhere. And some countries, people have tried to change that mechanism for a while. And, you know, we're kind of seeing a little progress. And in some places they haven't. And that was kind of what contributed to my comment that you would have expected a nation of the type of nation that Britain is to have made more progress. Because we can look at the world and say, well, those countries that did this did a little better, right? Mm -hmm. um, but overall, what we see is a pattern of disadvantage. And when we look at that disadvantage and then we see what happens when you increase the equality or decrease the equality, what we find mm -hmm. is that those countries that, that increase gender equality experience just an incredible boon in terms of peace and prosperity. And that those who do not, who remain mired in this inequality, experience hunger and violence and poverty. And it's because the mechanisms that hold gender inequality in place are very, very damaging. It's things like um, forced marriage, child marriage, trafficking, violence within groups and among groups. These things have costs associated with them. Mm. Now, I think... Linda, I'd like to ask you about these kind of mechanisms that you said, like hold the system in place. And if you could just talk more about what those mechanisms are and how they hold the system in place, and then maybe we can try to see how we can change them. Okay, so let's take a look at a graph, Maria, that will help, I think, illustrate this in a way that most people are not aware of. All right, so this is a graph where each of 106 countries has two dots, a black one for males who own land, and a red one for females. And you can see the meaning really in one glance. Uh, the black dots cluster at the top of the graph showing that 80 to 100% of global landowners are male, while the red dots cluster at the bottom showing that women around the world seldom own land, okay? And this pattern is really clear, really dramatic, really strong, so much so that it cannot be plausibly dismissed as some random occurrence. And it also can't be positive, I, I don't think, a plausibly dismissed by just saying that, oh, well, women all over the world have just chosen not to own the major store of wealth and power in world history. I mean, that is just that's pure gender bigotry, as, as far as I can see. This, this picture just begs to answer the question, what caused this to happen? What is the structural problem underneath a global uh, disproportionate um, allocation of land like this. 
So I went and researched this, and it took quite a long time. But what it is, is that there are all throughout history, in fact, we can document it as far as 4,000 years ago, there have been laws and customs that have ensured that land only passed from male to male, that women could not inherit land, could not own land, could not keep land. And it has lasted for, as I said, thousands of years. And while there have been sometimes where there's been reform, such as, for example, you can look at this graph and see that there's a scattering, a small number of dots in the middle where the men and the women are roughly equal. That's because in those countries, there have been recent reforms that, that caused that to happen. But we know from the historical record that what will happen is eventually it will go back to the default position and the men will control the land and the women will not. This is what I'm talking about in terms of the type of mechanism and how common it is across the globe. Now, with regard to Britain, let me just say that over on the far right and in the lower corner, right at the edge of the graph, if you look at the red dots, a far right, far right dot, that's Britain. Okay, and that's a pretty abysmal thing that they would be. It's 13.7% um, of landowners in Britain are female. That's, that's really abysmal. Okay, and one of the reasons, believe it or not, is because there is still this practice in Britain of the aristocracy controlling the land. I mean, this is really ancient. This, the distribution by gender of land in Europe is the same as what it was in the ninth century. And this is how slow these things are to change. All right. So in Britain, the land is still about 35% of it is, co is controlled by the aristocracy. And the aristocracy has, has um, practiced what we call in international development, sun preference, all right, mm -hmm. and, and continues to do so uh, for the most part. There's some a little change there, wherein the land can only pass from male to male. OK, and so it continues, even in the context of a modern society that think it has solved this problem, the land continues to stay in male hands. Now, a particular concern to me is that it has meant that half of the parliament is controlled by men also, because the House of the Lords, House of Lords traditionally has been titled landowning aristocrats and they have been male. And um, to have that in the infrastructure of your government, even is in, in addition to the infrastructure of your economy, is just inexcusable. And it would be a thing, it would be something that it would take a generation, maybe two, to change, but it's not that hard to see how you would do it. You would just change inheritance laws, you would change representation laws, and other countries have done it with success, and it can be done. Yeah, it's just over overcoming this political paralysis of will and making it happen. Right. Um, and of course, we only paralyze ourselves by continuing to tell ourselves we can't do it. So just saying we can yeah. do it. <laughs> we, can. we can do this. All yeah, of it. exactly. Because like we created the system um, and yeah. it came out through, yeah, through like conscious decisions that we've made um, and to feel like it's too big to change now it's just in complete contrast with how it was created in the first place yes yes this is it and we have to be realistic this system as you as from the example that i've just given you i mean you can look at the code of urnamu it is the first legal code we have that we know of um, you know the stone tablets kind of thing you can see it in that code i mean that's how old that is now. so we have to be realistic it may take us some time on the other hand <laughs> The system moves a lot faster now, and we have a lot more information. We have a lot more in the way of resources and communication. So there's no reason to think it would take us 4,000 years to change it. We can change it faster than that. Yeah, that's so true, because I think that a lot of the problems that humanity is facing at the moment with anything from climate change to the cost of living crisis now in the UK, like we have the resources to change this problem. We, we have the solutions, and we have the the ways to do it we just need to have like the the mechanisms also in the structures to enable that change to to become quite efficient and effective and to want to do it because we truly believe that it should be this yeah. way yes and and i think that 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 this might be a good time to start talking about um child care and the motherhood penalty and so forth because yeah, i think it's a really it's a really good example of how we think we can't do something and even though we know the problem needs to be solved and that it's hurting us, we keep not doing anything about it. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 it's really important to change. And it, it is, as you know, a big um, contributor to um, the gender gap. So Britain has the 
most expensive childcare in the world. Yeah. And one of the reasons for that is, is that child care in Britain as elsewhere is, is scarce. All right. There's not enough of it, you know, supply, demand, demand, supply. It's, it's scarce. And so it's expensive. And as a result, you have um, something like 60% of the female labor force is part-time. All right. And you're seeing the cost of living for individual households going up because not only of the cost of, um, you know, rent and groceries and whatever, but the cost of childcare is beca has become a significant part of any kind of young couples' house household budgeting considerations, right? And in the workplace, um, we continue to allow this um, notion that it's okay to discriminate against mothers so that somebody um, who's trying to make a decision about whether to have a child has to think about what it will do, the, the couple has to think about what it will do to half of their income and half of their, for, their future prospects. And we have to, they have to think about what resources then will be available to invest in their child, which by the way, the society needs them to invest in their child for the sake of the future economy, if nothing else. And so they end up not choosing not to have children or only to have one child. And that means then that the fertility rate goes into the toilet, right? This is what we're seeing all over um, the countries where they're not investing in childcare. And that then jeopardizes the future of the economy by changing the age structure. It means you have too many old people and not enough young people. Yes. And that just, it, it's, it, sends, um, it sends the economy potentially into, well, it's just a train wreck because you, you, don't, you don't have enough labor supply to keep growth going. You have to raise taxes for social services to, for old people, which means that you have a situation where um, uh, uh, the taxes are higher and people are having to squeeze their resources to meet both taxes and the cost of helping older people to live. All right. They don't have have as much disposable income so they can't save and they can't buy as much all right so your consumption goes down your savings goes down everything and and you just end up in a horrible spiral in addition to course all the problems of you know what do you do with a significant portion of your um, population going around with dementia or something right there's all kinds of social problems as well so we know that this is a problem we know that we're about to you know head off this cliff but we also know that we can change this by investing in childcare we know that we are losing gdp year after year after year by not making it possible for the women who want to be in the workforce to be in the workforce. We also know that if we invested in childcare, and I'm talking here about universal, affordable, high quality childcare funded by the government, just like the school system, right? That if we did that, it would pull enough women into the labor force who would not otherwise be there, that it would be paid for. Right. So we tell ourselves, well, we can't do it because it's too expensive. Actually, no, that's not true. It would pay for itself and then some. I think it's because we think of this as an or people who are making the decisions think of this as being an expense, like, you know, just to throw away spending all right, rather than investment. And they think of it as something, you know, really the women should be doing this anyway. And so why would we pay for somebody else to do it? It's a waste of money. Instead of thinking about it as infrastructure, economic infrastructure. And so what I would pose is that if we changed our thinking and said, okay, this is just like investing in an airport or a highway. If you have a significant amount of your population that can't get to work because there's no road, you build a road, right? And you don't even think about, is that a good idea? You build a road because you know if people can get to work and the road's going to get paid for, right? Same yeah. thing, exactly the same thing. And, um, and it would just bog down in these ideas that we just really need to, sh you know, shed. Uh, it's like an old skin. We need to crawl out of it. Do you also think this comes from like these particular attitudes that we have around care work? Um, that because of its kind of historical links with womanhood, with mothering, that we feel it's something that I think it, it translates into all care work, not just child care. But that this is something, as you said, that women should be doing anyway, or that is like inherently linked with women and therefore like how much value could it really be? Um, yeah. How much yeah. could it really be worth? Yes, all of these things. And, um, and, and, and it is going to be a particularly difficult situation as the population ages because you're going to have women expected to do 
the care at both ends of the age spectrum, which is going to mean that more of them are going to have to drop out of the labor market and that they're going to have fewer children because that's those are the only two parts of this equation they can control. Another cultural issue that occurs here is, is a lingering belief that somehow children need for their mothers to stay home and not go to work. Mm -hmm. okay? And that it's going to have a negative effect on them and that women don't really want to go to work, that they naturally want to be at home. Now, this is a, a pretty old set of ideas in the sense of they're not only it has a long history, but also it tends to be more held by older people than younger people in the world today, that those kinds of beliefs have been tapering off over the course of the last 75 years or so. And so that many people are surprised to learn that most young couples would prefer for the woman to go to work, but they just can't. So you're not forcing them into the workplace if you provide the means for them to do that. They want to do that anyway. Mm. Uh, the second thing is this idea that somehow the children are going to be harmed. And we've now got enough experience with this and research on this to know that that is just not the case. There was research beginning in the 1970s when people, you know, women were going into the workforce and people convinced it was going to hurt the children. And so many, many, many studies have been done in the last 50 years. And some of them said it was good for them. Some of them said it was bad for them. Well, at this point, what you can do is you can do what's called a meta-analysis and you take the findings from all those studies together. So that makes a huge sample, very reliable, huge sample. And you analyze them as a group and you do a meta-analysis. And the meta-analysis is the final word. It says, this is what the answer to this question is. So a meta-analysis was recently done of that data. And the answer is, there is no difference in childhood outcomes between children whose mothers work and children whose mothers do not work in terms of their emotional, their scholastic or anything. There's just no difference. It does not make a difference. At the same time, we also have enough time uh, that has passed that we can look at what are the outcomes for them as adults. So there's a study that you, it was a sample of 50,000 people across, I think, 10 countries, very large sample, very wide number of countries. And what it found was that the outcomes for uh, children of people whose mothers worked were the same, except right, that on the women's side, the women whose mothers worked made more money and were more likely to be the boss. Right? They advanced more and they made more money. And that the men were more likely to be engaged in, in childcare and engaged with their children. Wow. So on the one hand, the women were more successful in the world. And on the other hand, the men were more successful in the family. All right. So it's very much positive, that picture is. And that's another thing that we need to communicate to people, because I think there still is a fear that somehow it hurts the children. However, it is another reason why if we're going to invest in child care, it has to be good child care. It can't yeah. be that you're just going to put them in a closet somewhere because that will hurt. So what do you think the next steps are in terms of our like individual and collective kind of will moving forward, what can be done? What can we do? I think the first thing, as we've said, is just to talk about it, to get, get it out there and let's know what the information is. Let's discuss it with each other. Let's look at this as a problem that isn't me versus you, but it's us collectively solving a problem that actually we all want to solve. All yeah. right. And that's going to mean looking at the problem dispassionately and saying, you know, this over here is not contributing. This over here is making things worse. And I've identified some of these things already. So that, for example, getting rid of the positive discrimination doctrine is essential. All right. So that is something that is a legislative thing. And so a campaign would have to be undertaken and, and uh, candidates would have to come forward. But that is a matter of public pressure having a different agency created or a function added to the tax system or the benefit system whereby somebody else monitored equal pay would be another way. Some fairly simple things like actually just changing the amount of money you can get back from an, an equal pay discrimination suit would, would make a big difference. I think they, the British hate to think that they would ever become like the Americans on this issue. Um, <laughs> but but I, and I know that, but I think that, that taking a look at things like class action suits where women can, can sue as a group and therefore share the costs 
mm -hmm. um, would be a very important, that was very important in the United States. And it takes care to some degree of the, of the whole issue of legal fees. And the other thing that we have over here is punitive damages, where the government sort of says, look, this is a social problem, not just an individual problem. And so when we award damages, we want to make sure that we do it in a way that as is a deterrent for the future. I think the thing that would have more difference than any other single thing would be an investment in child care. Uh, it would take care of so many things, and if it is made available to everyone in high quality, it it makes such a difference for the whole future for the children. Yes. Uh, uh, we should all want to do that, and and so I think that a campaign there, and you know, sort of insisting that the calculus about the cost be done in a way that treats it as an investment and not an expense. Yes. I think all underlined by what you said and what we talked about at the beginning of the episode, which was um, just talking about it, making it known, bringing it into public awareness and discourse and alleviating the awkwardness and the kind of the, the shame and the barriers around that, like the emotional kind of barriers around that, and just making it culturally part of our society and something that we feel is an issue that we can tackle and and like therefore kind of coming in with these feelings of that everybody has value. Anybody who's not contributing to the workforce is somebody lost to the innovation that's happening in a particular country. And any child that feels like they've not seen their parents being treated equally in the workplace is one more person who lives their lives in the world believing things about men and women that are just not true. And I think a change right. to culture, a change to mindset is so important for all of these changes to be um, enacted and it starts with a conversation and so I think with this podcast we've solved all of these issues <laughs> the <neuroscience laughs> right. Upon the back. <laughs> right right exactly exactly I think another thing too to think about is that other forms of inequality get woven into this so that for example if you can if a family can afford expensive child care that person gets not just that child gets child development all right and if they can't right? That child does not have the same opportunities right from the beginning, mm -hmm. right? And so if we want to solve other kinds of inequalities, looking at this dynamic is important. And, um, and I think it's important also to recognize that children are a resource. They're not just private indulgences. Um, they're important uh, social res uh, resources and that, um, and we're not going to have enough of them. Right. We're just not going to have enough of them because we've been not making it possible for, for women to reproduce without punishment. Um, and we can't afford to waste them. They all are going, we are going to need for them all to be cultivated. And therefore, we need to provide development resources for all of them. Yeah. Like um, in the Baha'i writing, it says every child is potentially the light to the world. That's and right. It's like a potential. We all have that potential. And, um, and far be it from us as society to deter women from having children, but also from men, from fathering their children and from being in their children's lives. That's also such a massive um, inequality and such a, a danger to society um, right. to bar men from doing that because they have to then kind of fill fill in that, that deficit that's coming into the household um, because, you know, their partners aren't being paid what they should be. Right. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I think is, is nice to learn about the human species, about human nature, if you will, is that mm -hmm. we, te we tend to think of, of, you know, the women are naturally supposed to stay at home with the children and the men are naturally supposed to go out, right? Because the fathers are not like mothers and all this. But actually, one of the most important adaptive features of our species is that unlike in many other species, the fathers are equally able to take care of children that they are just as important. Well, maybe not quite as important, but almost as important if you, will <laughs> let them, if, they, if you will let them be, if you will let them do what their natural ability is, which is to help with the children, it feeds into what makes us an adaptive and surviving species. And yeah. it's nice, and it's just a better way, you know? It's just a better way. <laughs> Yeah. And I think just as men have had all of these hundreds of years to develop their entrepreneurial business capacities or capacities for being a good worker, employee, boss and manager. Um, we've also allowed like women for hundreds of years to develop the capacities to be good carers. 
-hmm. And so I think it's only natural to see a bit of a difference right now while things are still balancing out that like women can learn from men about like different skills and capacities that they have and men can learn from women. But I think we'll come to a point in human history where those differences are just very minuscule and we don't really see that as being part of our nature, but just as a, a natural interaction between our potential, the potential of our nature and how we've invested our time, our energy, our skills and our, and our money. Right, right. And exactly. And um, this is an important insight. In fact, is as if we allow for the fact that human nature is changeable uh, and that we can adapt in positive ways, that if each gender um, takes from the strengths of the other, all right, mm. the, that the ultimate outcome is, is sort of greater than the sum of the parts right? That you need to have, like, for particularly investment, for example, um, men tend to look for, they have a higher risk tolerance, for example, and women tend to look for more long-term gains. Well, in a, in a balanced portfolio, you need both, all right? Mm -hmm. And in a global economy, you need both. And in a global society, you need both. And eventually, that is what you would come to, I think, would be a more balanced um, way of life. And therefore, to return to where we started, an economy that isn't just about self-interest, an economy that is about provisioning the species with what they need to live, and ultimately also taking better care of the world that we're on, yeah, taking care of that resource as well. Beautiful. I think a beautiful place to, to wrap it all up. Okay. All right. All right. That's great. You don't want to talk about Barbie? Oh my God, now is the time to talk about Barbie. <laughs> We've wrapped up for those viewers and listeners who don't want to talk about Barbie. And now we move <laughs> to our most important segment. A few questions came up in the process of creating this episode, from talking with Linda Scott, to researching the topic and engaging with civil society. What are the attitudes and assumptions underlying the structures in our society around women as mothers and workers and men as fathers and workers? And how do they lead to particular choices made by individuals and communities which further entrench these attitudes and assumptions? What are the nuances of these issues when viewed through an intersectional lens, encompassing socioeconomic status, ethnic background, and education? How do we make sure that in our efforts to empower women within the economy, we do not inadvertently reduce the value of parenthood? Join us throughout this series where we'll be exploring these questions in more detail. We also encourage you to voice your thoughts in the comments section on our YouTube channel and on our social media platforms. Thank you so much to Professor Linda Scott for the hopeful tone of this conversation and for the absolute pleasure of collaborating with you on this episode. The world of humanity has two wings. One is women and the other men. Not until both wings are equally developed can the bird fly. Should one wing remain weak, flight is impossible. Not until the world of women becomes equal to the world of men in the acquisition of virtues and perfections can success and prosperity be attained as they ought to be.